The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, solar sail clipper ships head to the asteroid belt to make sure the buckle's tight enough to keep up the sun's pants. Science and psychic aliens, and why Pluto isn't as cute a little runt as you might suppose. Plus, the complete audio presentation of Magic and Other Honest Lies by Robert Butner. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. This time on the podcast, we have an interview with NASA scientist and Bain author, Dr. Les Johnson. Les is the co-author with Travis S. Taylor of Back to the Moon and the editor of an excellent science fact science fiction anthology called Going Interstellar. His book Rescue Mode, co-written with the great Ben Bova, will appear this June. Les talks about space science, solar sails, and what it will take for humanity to travel to the planets of this solar system and And beyond. beyond. We also have the complete audio presentation of a short story written by Robert Buettner. Bob is the author of the Orphan's Legacy science fiction series with entries Overkill, Undercurrents, and latest edition Balance Point. Notice a theme in those novel names which will be out in April, balance point that is, at booksellers everywhere. The short story is called Magic and Other Honest Lies, and you'll hear it complete after our discussion with Les. But first, here's the news. Want to mention the May mass market paperbacks? You'd probably know that the good old Bain Publishing Fountain issues forth with new books once a month, and these include the mass market editions of some of your favorite writers. Available at bookstores and at booksellers everywhere this month is David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. That's the book we spent most of 2013, and some of this year, serializing. This is, of course, the latest entry in David Weber's multiple New York Times and internationally best-selling Honor Harrington series, and it's the sequel to A Rising Thunder. Also out is the latest addition to the Leiden Universe by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. This is Necessity's Child, and check out Charles E. Gannon's Fire with Fire. This is the latest entry in a new science fiction series, and we're very happy that this book is now a Nebula Award finalist. Go Chuck! And hey, we have a new Eric Flint-Chuck Gannon collaboration coming to you this summer. It's a new novel in the Ring of Fire alternate history series. So something great to look forward to there. Finally, we have books four and five of the general series contained in one mega volume. This is Hope Rearmed by S.M. Sterling and David Drake. As I've mentioned several times before, Dave and I are continuing this great series with The Heretic, which will be out next month in mass market paperback, and its sequel, The Savior, which will be out in hardcover in September. I just saw the maps to The Savior, by the way, and they are beautiful. Randy Asplund... Our um, Bain cartographer did a great job, and they'll be available on the web and in ebook form in color, and those are cool. So pick up Hope Rearmed and its predecessor, Hope Reborn, to dive into the most excellent general series, and I do say that with the utmost objectivity and candor. Oh, that's really good. All these books in the Bain hardcovers and trade paperbacks for May, as well as the ebooks, of course, are at booksellers everywhere now. We want to welcome Les Johnson to the podcast. Hey, Les. Good morning. Les Johnson, Dr. Les Johnson, is the co-author of two Bane novels, Back to the Moon with Travis S. Taylor, and Upcoming Rescue Mode with Ben Bova. He is the editor with Jack McDivitt of uh, Bane's wonderful science fact science fiction anthology, Going Interstellar. Les is also the author of several science fact books, one of which has the wonderful title, Sky Alert, When satellites fall, or is it where satellites fall? It's actually when satellites fail. Fail, fail. Oh, I wish. Oh, I wish it was fall. (laughs) (laughs) But you have you have a lot of uh, of great. They sometimes fall, but I I think uh, (laughs) the biggest risk is if we lose them all, let alone where they come down. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Well, you've written many science fact articles for the Bain.com website. Uh, These 
all of these are collected in the free nonfiction collections at baneebooks.com. You can find them there. Not only is Les a prolific Bain author, he is also Dr. Les Johnson, physicist, of course, and deputy manager of the Advanced Concepts Office at the NASA George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. One of the coolest day jobs ever. So, Les, what is a scientist like you doing in a place like this? What, where do you come from? <laughs> well, the first thing I need to say is something that NASA asked me to say, since I do write science fiction, not as a part of my core NASA job, and that is that everything I say in an interview like this is my own opinion and doesn't reflect NASA, even though I'll be talking about space and, and space-related stuff. So how, how did I get in a place like this? Uh, Tony, I've always wanted to do it. I'm, I'm one of those uh, children of the 60s. I was, a, I, I was seven years old when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I was uh, watching Star Trek reruns shortly after that when they came on what seemed like late at night uh, at home. My sister started feeding me a habit which has been a lifelong addiction, which is reading science fiction novels. And I decided at about 10 or 12 years old that I wanted to work for NASA and I wanted to be involved in space and that someday I wanted to be a science fiction writer and, and, and pay back to the folks that help inspire me to study science. So that's really how I got started, and it seemed like everything after that was just a, a stepping stone on the path to doing what I've always wanted to do, which is explore space and, and write about the wonders of space and what we might encounter out there in my, my fiction as well as my nonfiction. So science fiction uh, was always there from the start with you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I, was incredibly, uh, I was incredibly lucky given some life circumstances that came my way. Uh, my sister was feeding me science fiction novels, and as a consequence, I was going with her frequently to the local bookstore in my hometown of Ashland, Kentucky, which is on the Ohio River, kind of where Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia all com come together in steel and coal country up there. And there was this wonderful bookstore. It's called the Book Rack. It's no longer open. And the woman who ran it was named Joe Howard. Well, shortly after my father died, when I was in middle school, like a week later, she said, Les, I want you to come work for me. And so I ended up starting work in ninth grade, working about 10, 15 hours a week, which ramped up to about 20 hours a week during high school, working at a bookstore. And, oh, it was terrible. I was in charge of the science fiction section. <laughs> I mean, how, how bad can it get, right? So I got to meet all the people who read science fiction in the community. I got to read the books. She'd let us bring them home and read them. And as long as you couldn't tell they'd been read, in other words, if the spine wasn't broken, I could put them back on the shelf and sell them to somebody. So it, it was just wonderful. I got to meet some great people, and they were all very encouraging of me as I was studying in high school and trying to get into a good college. I mean, it was just a wonderful thing uh, that happened after the tragedy of my father's death, and it set me on the path to just really enjoy reading and writing and people and science, and uh, I've just been a really lucky guy. Yeah. Did you um like many uh many former bookstore employers in their youth employees in their youth um a lot of you have perfected the method of reading a book without breaking the spine. Do you still do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You'll come into the library that we have here at our house and you'll think that I bought all these books and never read them, but in fact I've read almost all of them. <laughs> Uh, there, there's a story that I hope comes across on a podcast fairly well, but we had a, a visiting researcher come in from Europe, and he was lecturing at NASA, and I invited him into our home. We had some friends over for him to talk about his research, and he said, Les, I need some pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. I want to talk about something. So I have this wonderful collection. So it's a nice book that has all these great lithographs of Hubble. So I bring it to him, and the first thing he does is to make sure it stays open so everyone can see it. He widens it. It completely cracks the spine on the book. <laughs> my wife said I had this abject look of horror on my face. <laughs> she thought I was going to have a seizure as he broke the spine of the book. So the answer to your question is, yeah, I still do that. Uh, well, it's a, probably a good habit. Not one I've acquired. But uh, <laughs> So uh, after, when you went to college, uh, were you drawn to science immediately, or had you already been? Oh, absolutely. That's what I wanted to do. Um, being from Kentucky, I was uh, kind of limited in, in my scope. I wanted to go to a good school, but I didn't really think about going out of state. So I ended up going to uh, a private college in Lexington called Transylvania University. And in fact, uh, giving away my age, my 30th college reunions coming up in about uh, three or four weeks. 
But yeah, I was a physics major. I was the only physics major in my class of 250 students. So the uh, the faculty there were real good to me also in, in the classes selection. And my between my junior and senior year, they handed me the course catalog and said, which elective physics class do you want me to teach next year for your major? <laughs> and it ended up being almost an independent study with just me and a math major working with the physics professor in some of those elective classes my uh, my senior year of college. And then from there, gone to graduate school at Vanderbilt, and uh, the, the story was written. But yeah, absolutely. I've always been fascinated by science, and uh, while I was in school and to today, as I do it, I'm reading a science fiction book every week or two along the side. So tell us about your day job. I assume you don't sit around designing interstellar spaceships all day, or, or do you? <laughs> well, darn the luck, not all the time although it does come up occasionally. Uh, currently, in the Advanced Concepts Office, we're looking at space systems that will be flown in the next 15 to 30 years. And I'm very, very fortunate uh, to, to announce, really, it's not totally uh, been broadcast a lot yet, but a project that I've been trying to get going for a couple of years, which uses a uh, technology called a solar sail, has actually been selected for study and pro potential flight in 2017 a project called Near Earth Asteroid Scout. And so in this case, I'm not really designing an interstellar starship, but we're designing an interplanetary solar sailcraft that, uh, if, if we're successful, will be one of the smallest and lowest cost missions uh, beyond Earth orbit that we will have flown. So wow. I'm pretty excited yeah. about that. A few years ago, I did get to design interstellar spaceships. I was um, working on a project with JPL, it was called the Interstellar Probe Project. And the goal there was to design a spacecraft not to go to another star, but to go well beyond the edge of the solar system and get there very, very rapidly within about 20 to 25 years of launch, get out to roughly twice the distance that Voyager has currently flown after 35 years. So that was a challenge that we had. And uh, there at uh, Bain, Tony Weisskopf told me that was when she thought I had the coolest job title in the universe. <laughs> because for about two years, I was manager of NASA's Interstellar Propulsion Technology Research Project. But that uh, that project uh, has been put on the shelf because the technology wasn't quite here yet, and so our goals are a little bit more modest with some of our spacecraft. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. some of the stuff that I do work on. Well, has the um, – I know Japan has put up a solar cell. Have we done that, uh, the U.S.? Well, actually, yes, we have, although not as capable as the Japanese. In 2010, the Japanese launched Icarus, I-K-A-R-O-S. And I guess if they studied their Greek mythology, <laughs> they, they might not have named it Icarus. Yeah, that's and anyway, not the and best. it was successful, unlike the Greek Icarus, and uh, has been flying in, in near Venus space for about three and a half to four years now, successfully. It's a big sail. It's 14 meters on a side. And NASA has flown a small sail in Earth orbit, called NanoSail D, and that also came from here at Marshall. But it didn't really solar sail. It was more of a deployment test and how you would, uh, how you would open these things up in orbit. Our first flight of a big solar sail is supposed to happen in 2015. And by big, I mean big, 38 meters square, 38 by 38. And that's a project called Sunjammer. Um, I don't really have anything directly to do with Sunjammer, but it is uh, managed to here in Marshall, and the, the company who's building it is called Lagarde. And your, your uh, listeners may know that that's named after a short story written by Arthur C. Clarke. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, science fiction continues to influence those of us working on space actively. Cool. Well, since we're talking about solar cells, I was going to ask you about them later. But what's so great about solar cells? How do they, I mean, it, do they really get pushed by light? Absolutely. Yeah, your listeners may not all be familiar with solar sails, which means they need to come to more conventions where I talk about them, right? Um, a solar sail is essentially a sail, like on a sail ship, but it's made of a large, lightweight, reflective material. The more reflective, the better. So we use uh, plastics or polyimides, cover them with a thin layer of aluminum, pretty reflective, greater than 85%, maybe 87% reflective, which means as light falls on it, it bounces off. Well, even though light doesn't have any rest mass, it does have momentum, which just like if you're playing pool and you, you, you shoot the, uh, the cue ball and you hit another ball, it hits it and, and transfers some of its momentum to make that other ball move. 
all these particles of light, the photons, uh, bouncing off the sail will cause it to move. So yes, absolutely, you're using sunlight to push the sail. And you can use that to maneuver in deep space and, and use it uh, if, you, if you angle the reflected light properly to either accelerate or decelerate your spacecraft, which causes you to move either toward the sun or away from the sun. So this is a way to explore primarily the inner solar system and not use any fuel. A ship that has a solar sail will never run out of gas, which means as long as the ship is functioning, the mechanical and electrical systems are functioning, you can go wherever you want as long as there's enough sunlight falling on your sail. Wow, like That's the old days, like the old days of the clipper ships on on the Earth, almost. I guess. Absolutely. I guess those are kind Maybe of solar sail. Cool. Yeah. Is the so how big is this one? How big do you estimate this one might be that will take the the asteroid exploring craft out? It's going to be uh, almost ten meters on a side. So I'm talking metrics, so remember a meter is about three feet. So uh, almost uh, 30 feet by 30 feet. So it's going to be pretty big. Uh, that, and it's all going to package into a small box about the size, maybe a little bit bigger of a standard Kleenex box. Wow. Well, I, I picture these things as, as those emergency blankets you get with, um, with your uh, first aid kit. Is that something like the material, or is it completely different these days? Uh, it's completely different, much, much thinner. Uh, <laughs> thinner. Just think wow. of something that is thinner than a strand of your hair, but, but a sheet made out of it. So just literally take aluminum foil and cut it into about a third of the width of a piece of aluminum foil, and you'll have an idea about how, how thick this material is. It's, it's, um, you, you hold it and you mess with it. It's not as sticky as saran wrap, but it kind of feels like saran wrap. And it's got the aluminum reflective coating, and you can fold it up and, and deploy it pretty easily. It's pretty robust, too. That was the neat thing about these materials. We, we couldn't have done this 30 years ago. We didn't have the materials that were lightweight and, and could be packaged and handled without damaging like we do now. Well, that's cool. It's, uh, I want to ask you something, some more about technology then. Um, now, I'm back to the moon. Your, um, your novel you co-wrote with Travis S. Taylor, China has crashed... Uh, some astronauts on the moon, and the first U.S. trip back to the moon is, is going to be a rescue mission, kind of an accelerated uh, deployment. Uh, meanwhile, on Earth, the scientists uh, at, at the mission control have to figure out how to rescue these guys and how much equipment they can dump and how to create a system that will bring everybody back to Earth. Um, you, you posit a new class of rockets in the book. Um, you know, like there's your solar sail technology has changed so much in the last in the years since the 1970s when we went to the moon. What what would a trip to the moon be like today, and could we even do it? Well, the answer to the question is, can we do it? We can absolutely do it. it it's um, it, it's a question, unfortunately, that comes down to will and and money. Uh, the the new kind of of rocket that we posited in the book is something that's actually being developed today. It's just not quite perfected. That's why it cross the line from being science to science fiction and back to the moon. And that was with the private space company that had a reusable spacecraft that was going to loop around the moon, not actually land. And it used a, a type of air-breathing rocket called a scramjet, which would offload the need for carrying as much propellant because essentially it pulled the oxidizer, the oxygen from the atmosphere as it was flying to fuel itself, making it a lot more efficient to get into space. But to send crew to the surface of the moon still requires launching a lot of mass. If you've ever been to Huntsville or, or Houston at the Johnson Space Center and you see the Saturn V, it's an enormous rocket. Oh, yeah. I grew up going there. I, I grew up not far from Huntsville in Anniston, Alabama, and it was, you know, it was a, a yearly trip to go over there and, and stand near that Saturn V. It was just, uh, it dwarfs you. Well, it's like, it's like a pilgrimage, isn't it? <laughs> Really, it was, and that was, you know, I, I saw my first moon, mar moon rock there, and uh, I saw Miss Baker, the, the little rhesus monkey. Oh, yeah, I remember that from when I first came here. Absolutely, yeah, that, and, and the rockets are just huge. And so if you, you were there, you, you probably walked around the outside when it was laying on its side. It's, it's now in a building and protected, but it's enormous. But that's what it would still would take today to go to the moon is a big rocket. And you could do it with lots of smaller rockets, and what you would do is you would assemble things in orbit if you did it that way to go to the moon. But the key is you've got to put enough rocket fuel 
on the moon to get you back off the moon and into space. And that's, that's, that's one of the issues that drives how much weight we have to launch into space to get to the moon so people can get back. So the answer to your question is, of course, we can go to the moon and back. The technology was here in the 60s. The capability to do it is still here today. It just would require um, that being an objective to go do and people having the money and resources to pull that together. Personally, I think that we're going to see just like in our book, Back to the Moon, we're going to see after Earth orbit is commercialized for tourists. I think the next logical step for space commerce is is moon trips. And, and I think tourists will probably be leading the way, and following that will be mining and eventual development of cislunar space for not only mining but for things like space solar power. And I think commercial will lead the way for a lot of that because I believe there's a lot of money to be made there. Yeah, one of the themes of, of your um, nonfiction, your science books, is that there's a great deal of resources in space, and if we just found a way to to get there and exploit them, um, it would it would it's just a surprising amount of stuff out there we could use, and that would be really great to have. Well, yeah, and in, in fact, uh, last night uh, my wife and I attended a uh, a webcast from the TED conference that was held in Canada. And one of the sessions was called Planet Dearth, D-E-A-R-T-H. Mm-hmm. And it was, a, it was a series of TED Talks about the finite resources of the planet and, and how we can be more efficient and use more renewable energy. And I, I found the whole thing, as positive as these people were trying to be, I found it all rather depressing because I think they were overlooking something, and that is that we're not limited to the resources of the Earth. Uh, we have this whole solar system out there full of resources that are literally just waiting on us to go start using them. And and my vision for the future, if someone were to make me the czar, or whatever you want to call it, well, we could do worse. <laughs> over what we were doing, I would say let's invest in the technologies that enable industry and commerce to go to space so we can tap these resources and bring them home to feed our industrial civilization so that we can stop strip mining the earth of its resources. Let's you make the earth a place for life and a place to live, and let's go where there is no life in space, and let's settle there, and let's, bring, let's mine those asteroids. Let's beam that energy back down here, and let's take advantage of the only place that we know of where life exists and keep it habitable for us and for the other life, and let's make the solar system our industrial base. So that's, that's my vision for the future, and I, I hope that I uh, hope I can at least see the first steps of that taken uh, while I'm in this life. This would be good for the environment on Earth, ultimately. This is not a, an anti, uh, anti-conservation, anti-even environmentalist uh, position. This would be something that, if they could only see, would accomplish all the goals that, they, that, that we might want in that regard, taking care of our own planet. Absolutely. And in fact, just to plug one of my books, there's a book that I wrote with my uh, friends and colleagues, Greg Matloff and C. Bangs, called uh, Paradise Regained, and we're having the second edition of that book come out this year. It's called Harvesting Space for a Greener Earth. And that's really our manifesto in that book, is that the pro-space community, of which many people who listen, I'm sure, to the, the Bain podcast and read the Bain books are, should get married to a group that they don't often associate with, which is the environmental and green groups, and 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 come together and realize that Together, we're stronger than fighting each other, and that we should be better uh, conservationists and use our resources more wisely here on Earth, but we don't have to have limited growth and limited expectations. We can protect the planet by going off-planet, and uh, perfectly, in my opinion, it's ethical. There's no life out there. Only life that will be there is life we bring, and if we can help preserve and protect the planet at the same time, to me, it's just a no-brainer. Uh, the Sierra Club and the World Wildlife Federation ought to be arm in arm with the National Space Society and the Planetary Society and, and advocating for these kind of things. Yeah, well, absolutely. The problem is, of course, political and that environmentalists are so often uh, political utopians. Um, but we, we shouldn't get into that. <laughs> but it it's, makes perfect sense, I think. So you have a new novel coming from you and Ben Bova that's going to be out in June called Rescue Mode. And this one, you go to Mars. And we'll certainly want to talk to you and Ben then. This is one about 
traveling to Mars and a Mars and what a Mars-bound spacecraft is like. Can you explain what your model for that uh, that trip is in the book? Well, sure. Uh, there have been a lot of studies done, and you can go search on the internet for studies that have been done by NASA, the European Space Agency, the Russians, private groups, Bob Zubrin and his famous book, The Case for Mars, to talk about the technologies of going to Mars and what you have to do. But I'm not sure when you get beyond the technology element that the real human element has come through. Okay. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things that I think doesn't come across in all the studies and technical books that are on this, this description of how we'll go to Mars is the human element and, and the fact that imagine you and your, your seven best friends Mm-hmm. packed in a Winnebago <laughs> for two years, and, and you live in something not much larger than one of the big RVs that retirees drive around, right? And, and you're going to be there with your best friends for two years, and the only thing separating you from death is the skin of that uh, RV from what's outside there. And you're at the mercy of what the sun does. You've got to make sure that all the equipment works flawlessly, you have limited ability to repair and replace things, and, and you're far, far away from help. And, and there's a point at which you get on your voyage that if something goes wrong, you cannot turn back. You're committed for that full two years. And, and just imagine, you know, you know how it is when you, you, you have Christmas time with your kids and they're out of school and you all love each other and you're having a great time, but after about a week and a half, you're kind of ready for the kids to go back to school or you're ready to go back to work. Well, you don't have that option when you're in this spacecraft going to and from Mars. You're stuck with these people. You've got to get along with them. And uh, the human element, I think, is, is, is what we often don't really understand about what that impact is. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a long voyage. That, that dwarfs the, uh, the, the voyage to the moon with just a few heartbeats in comparison. On a, on a trip like this, you know, you're going to have mixed gender crew in all likelihood. So you have men and women. And these are not just any men and women. These are type A personalities, overachievers, very capable people who uh, know what they want and probably have uh, a sex drive that's, that's probably above average given the human population. So anytime you're going to be in uh, circumstances like that, you're going to have people seeking dominance, both in terms of the psychological sense. You're going to have people having romantic interest with each other. Um, I, I'm a little... A little conservative, though, because I also believe that there are going to be people out there in the future, just like in our past and today, who have more traditional values, who are committed to their relationships and their families. It, in the book, we have uh, characters in committed relationships with a spouse back home, and, and think about how difficult it would be to leave your your family and your spouse for two years. Yeah, and as you get farther away, the, the time lag of... Uh, of... Uh, electromagnetic transmission grows. You can't really talk to them real time. That's right. Um, e- even though when, when you think about the distance from the Earth to the moon, it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's that far if you're just looking at the closest approach distance. But there are going to be times when the when, when not the moon, Mars. There are going to be times when Mars is, is not that close. It's actually on the opposite side of the sun from where we are. And we're 93 million miles from the sun. So it takes minutes, uh, up to 20 minutes or more, for a message to get there. So there is, a, there is a point at which it just becomes impossible to have a dialogue. So what you instead have are, are packets of monologue, and then you wait 25 minutes to an hour, and you get your response. So just the logistics of communicating with home are difficult. They yeah. sure are. Well, I, I, I really um, – I've read the book and was an editor on it, of course, Rescue Mode um, – and uh, I, I just really love the job you've done with the various uh, various characters there. And there are different kinds of people on that trip, and they are stuck in a Winnebago for two years, which is a, which is a, a cringing prospect, perhaps, to think about in real life. Well, that, that's right. One of the challenges uh, beyond just the psychological challenges of a trip to Mars are the physical challenges. We, we know that the human body decays when there's no gravity. Our, our bones get brittle. Our muscles get weak. Uh, astronauts on the space station have to exercise. Are you ready for this? Four hours every day. Okay, now even the, the most ardent exercise fanatic that I know doesn't exercise four hours a day, right? But that was, that's what they have to do on space station. And even then, when they come home, if they've been up there for a long time, they can't walk once they get back in Earth's gravity. They have to be carried. There was a, there was a Russian cosmonaut who was on the Mir space station of the Russians at the time the Soviet Union collapsed. 
So he came back, and the country that launched him no longer existed. So he came back to Russia, and he'd been up there for over a year. I believe his name was Krikalev, and he had to be carried out of the capsule because he couldn't support his own weight under his muscles. Now talk about a risk of a crew going to Mars where they're going to land on another planet into the unknown, and unless they have artificial gravity, which is what was designed into the craft for, for rescue mode, they're going to land, and they may not be able to stand up. And if they fall, their bones will have gotten brittle and are more likely to break. So we, there need to be countermeasures for that, and the best countermeasure is weight-bearing exercise. So, yeah, we have something in the novel that happens that causes that system to no longer function. And so they have to immediately start doing countermeasures. And, and, and we also postulate that there are some breakthroughs in biotechnology, which I think really will happen that help the body adapt to that in zero G and it won't be as bad as what we face today. So in about 20 years, maybe we won't have to do as much dependence on exercise and artificial gravity. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to treat uh, osteoarthritis mm -hmm. and osteopenia, which are very serious but similar conditions to what astronauts face. And, and I can't help but think in the next uh, 25 to 30 years, especially with the aging of the baby boomers and the huge market for drugs and treatments for that, that there'll be better treatments for that, and that'll spin into the space program, perhaps, and help make it less of a risk. Yeah. Well, I saw, um, oh, I can't think of her name, a mission commander uh, at, at the space station run a marathon on their treadmill up there at one point. Yeah, she has to do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well get the... Yeah, that's just it. It sounds like this great thing that she's doing, and it is, but what you don't see is that she's probably running on that treadmill for two hours a day every day mm -hmm. in terms of training just to stay fit. So interstellar travel, Les, you've, you've given it a lot of thought, um, and you, you even headed a task force about it. Can we ever truly pull it off as a species, and, and how is that going to happen? Wow. Can we pull it off? I think nature has been somewhat unkind to us in terms of the vast distances between stars. And... Uh, just just quick quick illustration. The um, the the Earth to Sun distance is is one astronomical unit, 93 million miles. The closest star is 270,000 astronomical units. So 270,000 times 93 million miles. Oh my! How are we ever going to cross that quickly? The answer is chemical rockets can't do it. It'll take 70,000 years for Voyager to get to the nearest star. But there are ways that it looks like uh, nature has left some loopholes for us that says that we can accelerate spacecraft to the speeds that will let us get there in 100 to 1,000 years. And the, one of those ways is the future of technology that I like and love, actually, which is solar sailing, where you could build very large solar sails, perhaps the size of the state of Alabama or larger, launch them really close to the sun, get them moving really fast, and then continue to push them with a high-power laser so that you can make the trip in under 100 years. Now, do we know how to build a sail that big? No. Do we have the materials to build it? No. Do we have a laser that has the power output of humanity today to push it? No. But there's no fundamental physics that says it's impossible. When you look at the physics, it's all sound. It's a matter of ingenuity, engineering, and I think it'll just take time for us to build the capability to do that. So you think uh, the ways you can do it. an industrial base in the solar system, if we get in the solar system, then it's far more likely that we'll have the kind of uh, technology that will enable us to do that. I mean, that seems a no-brainer. but Well, to me, it is. Um, I, I think there are other options that I won't go into for the sake of time, but uh, nuclear uh, fusion, power, antimatter, which is real, and to me would be the ultimate starship drive that's within the known laws of physics would be an antimatter craft. And, and my, my uh, goal of greening the Earth and us becoming a uh, spacefaring civilization to help protect the planet is really uh, a secret first step toward giving us the stars. Because once we're masters of our solar system and able to tap the resources that are there, we will be wealthy beyond our dreams. And once we are a wealthy, solar system-wide civilization, the next logical step is to become an interstellar species. I think it's too big of a jump for us as a planet-bound species right now. But if we can become that 
solar system wide civilization. We, the, the galaxy is ours. Yeah, and, and as you've said uh, in several times in talks and such, there's a lot of planets out there we know about now, thousands of them that we know about. Cool about that, Tony, is that if you're a science fiction reader, you're saying, well, of course there are. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we've even has seen only known yeah. about these since they were first detected in 1992. Prior to that, the only thing that we knew of with the planets was our own star. So now there are thousands of these exoplanets, some of which may be like the Earth. We don't know yet, but there are hints that they may be, and we think there are billions of them. So yeah, absolutely. Now, now, what's the likelihood of one being another Earth with the temperature and atmospheric composition and and similar life, I think that likelihood is very, very small, close to zero. But that doesn't mean there aren't ones that we can't live on. I, I, I firmly believe as we start exploring the galaxy, uh, we'll find places that could become additional homes for humanity as we go. Well, let's, let's return to Earth for a bit. As a, as a physicist and science fiction writer, can you tell us some ideas you might have about the near future. Um, what kind of new breakthroughs seem possible based on the cutting edge of science and particularly your discipline today? And, and what do you fully expect to see maybe in the next 50 or 100 years? Well, I think a lot of us are a little disappointed at the pace with which space exploration has happened since Apollo. And uh, we're finally, I think, breaking the, uh, the biggest barrier to exploring the solar system, which isn't really a technological barrier. It's, it's the flight rate barrier. The number one thing to increase the frequency of access to space and make it cheaper is the more flights you have, the cheaper each flight becomes. And I think we're going to see that with this growth and advent of commercial space. For me, I think the 21st century is going to be the century of biotechnology. As a physicist who is kind of on the outside looking in, talking to, to some of my colleagues here in town who work at various biotech research institutes, which are also here in Huntsville, we're, they're unlocking the, the keys of life and in terms of how to adapt and, and modify uh, and, you know, de-extinct creatures, perhaps modify human evolution. So what, what I see is it uh, could be a very strange future indeed where we actually genetically modify human beings so they can adapt and survive for deep space exploration and, and perhaps adapt ourselves to the worlds that we find. So in the near term, just like the 20th century was the century of, of physics and traditional engineering, I think the 21st is the century of biotechnology and bioengineering. And you marry that with information technology, the breakthroughs that we're making there, um, I think the potential of having us become some kind of a global consciousness uh, with people interacting uh, with each other. Um, and with, you know, the net is going to be there, and then we're going to be changing what it means to be human over the next hundred years. It has the potential to be wonderful, and it scares me to death at the same time. Yes. I think we're just going to have to go into it with open eyes. Where can we find you this year? What are you working on? I understand you're not going to the International Space Development Conference because something else came up. Well, that's right. Um, uh, for, for NASA, I'm actually going to a conference in Germany called Space Propulsion 2014 where I'll be updating the international uh, space propulsion community on the work that we're doing on solar sailing uh, within the United States as a propulsion system. Um, I'm also uh, going to be at a few other conferences this year that are professional for space propulsion kinds of work. But there's one really fun one that I've been asked to go talk about my main book, the Going Interstellar book, and that's at uh, EVE Online Games Fan Fest in Iceland which takes place in, in May. Oh, cool. They would like me to come talk about going to the stars and uh, do a book signing for Going Interstellar. And uh, this community of gamers, which are building their own galactic empires, want to know how they might actually do that someday. So that's exciting. I'm looking forward to talking to them. Yeah. And any of you that have ever uh, seen uh, Les at a science fiction convention, they always put him on the science paddles. And he just, he really does a wonderful job of uh, explicating this stuff and making it accessible. And it's just always a fun panel to go to. The only thing I guess I'd want to add is if people want to learn about more about what I'm doing and where I'm going to be, they can visit my website at uh, lesjohnsonauthor.com. I'm also on Facebook at uh, Les Johnson Author, and I have uh, Twitter at Les Author. 
So Les Johnson is Deputy Manager for the Advanced Concepts Office at the NASA George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And for us, he's the author of Bain novel Back to the Moon with Travis S. Taylor and the co-editor of the great anthology Going Interstellar and co-author coming up in June with Ben Bova of Upcoming Rescue Mode, the Mars book. Les, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Tony. It was a lot of fun. If you're a regular reader of the monthly free fiction on the Bain.com website, and if you're not, what's wrong with you? You'll know that we often have an author write a short story involving a cool secondary character from an upcoming book. This month, we have a story from Robert Butner, and this is the story of Tamara Welder, a character who will certainly also be making an appearance in Bob's upcoming Orphan's legacy novel, Balance Point. Magic and Other Honest Lies by Robert Butner, read by P.J. Mask. Tamara Welder visored her right hand above her eyes and stared skyward at the star cruiser. Drifting down as silent as a pearlescent feather, the great ship cast a shadow broader and darker than a storm's clouds. Around her churned casino chauffeurs, freelance escorts, and purveyors of the other diversions that earned foundationally Earth-like 117, its common name, Funhouse. Tam's job wasn't normally guest pickup, but the Earthman she was picking up was no normal guest. She slid a two-titan coin from her pocket, rolled it across the backs of her left hand's fingers, thumbed the brass disc under her palm, repeated, then shifted it to her right. The finger rolls calmed her, but also maintained the nimble fingers that now made her living, as Pop had always believed they would. Not that Tam believed everything Pop had believed. Pop had believed in what he called honest lies, and he was dead. Tam believed that, except for magic, lies were lies, and she was still alive. Clang. The hovering cruiser's gangway telescoped out from the vast hull, rang against the arrival plaza's flagstones, then rumbled as a tide of disembarking vacationers flooded down it. Tam whispered her guest's name into her handheld, then raised its screen high, so the three-inch-tall red letters would lead the Earthman to her. She was predisposed to mistrust Dr. Trevor Jameson because she mistrusted everyone who wasn't Pop. Also, Merlin told her Jameson was a true-born Earthman, and like most outworlders, Tam believed that it was easier to take a true-born's money than it was to take a true-born. But mostly, Tam mistrusted Jameson because he was from the government and he was here to help her. In her lifetime, Tam had suffered the lie in that crummy joke often, enjoyed its truth never, and couldn't afford to misplace her trust again. The man with watery blue eyes waved a hand at her as the crowd buffeted his spindly body. Predictably, he wore neat casuals. Less predictably, he carried himself with round-shouldered diffidence, rather than the upright openness that Trueborns called self-assurance and outworlders called arrogance. He extended his hand to her, smiled. Trevor Jameson. She nodded, furled her hand held, then shook the proffered hand like it was attached to a corpse, not to a cop who had a Ph.D. in gaming theory. I'm Tam Welder. Jameson's eyes widened. Tamara Welder? You came to meet me yourself? She pointed to her left. Dr. Jameson, baggage claim is this way. The Earthman held up a faded knapsack. A fresh up-shuttle carry-on tag still dangled from one shoulder strap. This is all there is, the Trueborn smiled again. And call me Trevor, please. Jameson raised his eyebrows when he saw the Merlin's House of Cards electro bus. Sagging on worn springs, it squatted diagonally where Tam had parked it, blocking both VIP pickup lanes. A gray-haired casino chauffeur, leaning against the fender of the limo that the bus blocked in, shook his finger at Tam. Next time I'll turn you into the Port Authority, Tam. She wagged a finger back at the old man. Don't, or next time I'll turn you into a toad, Leo. He dismissed her threat with a wave. Everybody knows magic's a lie. Tam called back. Exactly. That's what makes it an honest lie, the chauffeur sighed. Just move that heap. 
As he turned away, the old man scolded over his shoulder. You got a serious problem with authority, young lady. Three minutes later, Tam felt the clunk as the parkway's auto lane took over driving. She sat back and looked out the window, away from the earth man in the front passenger seat alongside her. Jameson said, He seemed angry. I assume he would turn you in next time. Tam shook her head. Doubtful. I got Leo that job. Trueborns assume too much. But you assumed a trueborn would have so many bags that you brought a bus. No. You need a VIP lane permit to park close, so I brought a bus. Plus, I refuse to buy new tags for my car. Ah, Jameson nodded. So you don't have a problem with trueborns, you just have a problem with authority? Tam shrugged. If authority has a problem with me. Jameson pursed his lips. I assume you know why I'm here. Tam gripped the wheel, breathed deep. Because authority had a problem with her? To ask me questions because I followed the rules and reported an incident to the gaming authority? Jameson nodded. Tam said, Merlin said there won't be trouble with my dealer's license if I'm forthcoming. Jameson smiled. I expect your Merlin's right. So tell me how you remember the incident. Incidents. It's happened three times now, since the first one. Last month, I was dealing during my show and I felt... Tam spun a hand at her temple. A ping. But not a ping. Jameson cocked an eyebrow. A ping? She rolled her eyes. I don't know what you call it at a university doctor. In the real world, we call it a ping when a card cheek sneaks a physiologic sensor into a casino to read the dealer's ticks, to get a betting edge. Dealers are trained to feel it. I assume pinging is common on Funhouse? Tam wrinkled her forehead. It's non-existent on Funhouse and every other gaming jurisdiction. Pinging is obsolete. Because you can't ping a bot. All the casino's table games are dealt by bots. You're not a bot. Sharp, you trueborns. Tam shook her head. Dealing limited stakes games incident to card manipulation and table magic is defined as entertainment, not gaming. You still need a dealer's license, though. There's maybe four of us card pushers working the smaller casinos and a couple lounges around Funhouse. Ah, but the important thing is, whoa! Tam and Jameson pitched forward as the bus hard braked itself. A hundred yards ahead, three fawn-colored, droop-snooted quadrupeds, each standing over twenty feet tall at the shoulder, had lumbered out of the orange and violet forest beside the road. The pods hopped the parkway's border fence, crossed the traffic lanes, and resumed grazing the trees in the parkway's medium. Jameson whistled. First live titanopods I've seen. Surprisingly agile. The bus sped itself up. Tam shrugged. The pods always surprise first-timers, but the government says they're road hazards. Jameson wrinkled his brow and pointed at the Casino Grand Luxuriana, a pair of alabaster 80-story crescents that rose like ship sails above the multi-hued forest. Human presence on most outworlds affects less than 1% of the planet. Most indigenous species just learn to avoid us. Pods may be agile, but fast learners? Tam shook her head. No. A two-place open animal control skimmer popped up above the treetops and streaked for the three pods. The right seat warden leaned out and darted the biggest. It wobbled and crashed into the underbrush as the smaller two sprang back into the forest from which they had come. Tam sighed. They'll haul that one off to one of the tracks and race it to death. Isn't that crap? Jameson cocked an eyebrow. You disapprove of paramutual wildlife contests, but you make your living here? Without them, Funhouse would be just another subtropical Earth-like. You ever actually see full-contact titanopod racing, Jameson? They strap spiked armor skirts around the pods, hop them up on speed, and they gore each other the whole way round the track while the jockeys beat the hell out of one another. The Luxoriana disappeared behind them. Tam said, By the sixth race, 
blood turns the finishing line straight into red mud. Life expectancy is six months for the pods, three for jockeys. I feel sorrier for the pods. Oh? The animals aren't intelligent enough to know it. But they don't even have a choice. The jocks are intelligent, so at least they have that. Jameson said, I suppose the worst of all worlds would be to have the intelligence but not have the choice. Tam looked away, nodded. Trueborns would be surprised how often that happens on the outworlds. Some trueborns might not be. Surprise works both ways. Then the Earthman was again peering out at the next landmark. Tam said, That monstrosity over there is the Funhouse Sporting Club. The amphitheater in the middle of the Coliseum. They import the biggest off-world species to fight the biggest local ones. Makes pod races look like gerbil wrestling. With bigger bets? Most profitable gaming enterprise in the human union, 12 years running. It was a question she thought a gambling expert wouldn't need to ask. Jameson eyed a road sign as the bus continued up Resort Row on Lucky U Parkway. These are the most exclusive resorts in the human union, but the name of the main road sounds like it belongs in a row of cheap motels. Tam shrugged. The gaming authority names the roads, so the names evoke and promote gaming, even if they sound like crap. The conversation between Tam and her visitor had fizzled into trivia, but Tam's anxiety about this Trueborn's mission hadn't shrunk a micron. She asked Jameson, Why would a crummy table game fix report bring an expert like you all the way out here from Earth? Jameson's smile flickered, but only for a heartbeat. Actually, it didn't. Bring me from Earth, that is. I had just come into the mousetrap aboard the Valley Forge headed home. Then word of your report caught up with me. Iwo Jima was outbound for Funhouse fifty minutes later. You know I had to sprint for that connection. Hair stood up on Tam's neck. I do? Your dealer's license says you were born and raised in the mousetrap. Crap. Jameson's doctorate and smile notwithstanding. He was, after all, a kind of true-born cop, and cleverer than he looked. He had managed to not answer her question to him, but flipped it into a question that let him test her. Tam swallowed her breathing, kept her eyes on the road. Oh, she smiled. Yep, third-generation trap rat. Welder, is that a common name in Mousetrap? Actually, it had been picked for her because it was the most common. She nodded. My grandfather emigrated as a cutter's apprentice during the build-out. Tam Welder's legend was respectable, yet generic. So far, it had bought her the anonymity the True Bloods had promised. Jameson laid back against his headrest and closed his eyes like a weary traveler. Maybe because she had passed his test. Maybe because she was paranoid and it wasn't a test at all. Five minutes later, Jameson set up with a start when Tam turned off the parkway onto the seedy strip of grind clubs, slot shops, and package stores that she drove by when she was going to work each day. She sighed. If lucky you parkways the class of funhouse, the monster mile, well, isn't. Jameson pointed at the sign above the prefab domelet on the right and read aloud, Bug tussle? Beneath the sign's undulating neon letters hung a clear steel globe bigger than the electrobus. Inside the globe, a man-sized crimson scorpion and a bear-sized tiger-striped spider lunged at one another, kept apart by a transparent partition that bisected the globe. The giant's attacks swung the globe beneath its mounting. A bleary knot of men stood alongside the road, drinking from plastis swaying beneath the globe and taking in the free show. The flat screen beneath the animals announced ever-changing perimutual odds. The scorpion currently was favored 5-2 and promised, Admission includes Monster Mile's longest buffet. Tam said, The Coliseum's the top of Funhouse Animal Perimutual. The bug houses are the bottom, but admission's cheap, and they're always open. They're considered good entertainment value for the money. To say nothing of the buffet. 
the bug houses can afford to give stuff away. They actually collect bounty from the government for taking bugs out of circulation. The winners eat the losers, so feed costs the owners nothing, and the bugs are naturally competing predators, so there's never danger of peace breaking out when the bell sounds. Efficient, yet so classy. They passed five slot parlors before Tam swung the bus into Merlin's cracked and weedy lot and parked in front at the courtesy bus sign. Jameson craned his neck at the hollow-generated lettering that floated above the casino's roof, bright even under the afternoon suns. So this is Merlin's house of cards? The name faded, and Tam's smiling image wearing the evening show's blue velvet sorceress robe replaced it. On screen, she spun. The robe flowed, and nobody could tell it was a cut-down bathrobe. She produced cards and fans and fountains from her fingertips, transposed them into stacks of chips, then cascaded more cards from one hand to the other. The video cycled back to the casino name, and Tam shrugged at Jameson. I deal at the center stage table as a novelty act. Card manipulation and sleight-of-hand magic, mostly. Simple escapes, a couple illusions. Jameson eyed his pewter glanced around the parking lot. Noon and the place is full, unless those cars belong to the help. The matinee draws, so we all have to park out back, Tam shrugged again. But if the crowds ever start shrinking, Merlin will replace me with a piano bar. Jameson furrowed his brow. But you'll still get by. She snorted. Get by? Outworlders always get by, Dr. Jameson. Sometimes we get by with help from friends. Sometimes we get by with a lie or a mistake. I'll get by shoveling bug crap if I have to. Trueborn empathy normally extended only as far as other trueborns, but for an instant, Jameson's eyes softened. Then he was again the Inquisitor. You called this road the Monster Mile, but so far, he jerked his thumb over his shoulder, the only animals I've seen were the bugs. The real monster shows down the road, Tam pointed over the vacant lot's trees. See the dome? That's Critterfest. They import off-world exotics to fight local animals, the poor man's coliseum. The species aren't as big or as common. There's no performance record on most of them, so the outcomes are less predictable. That makes it popular? They fill 10,000 seats a night, biggest draw on natural way. Natural way? Monster Mile's not the street's real name. Jameson smiled. Natural way. I like that. Not every street name on Funhouse is about gambling. Tam stiffened. In that instant, all the little inconsistencies about Jameson, the uncharacteristically empathetic Trueborn, congealed in her gut. Then the memories that she had hidden away for twenty years flooded back. The men with the trueborn accents who came and sat with Pop and whispered with him, Pop telling her to forget she ever saw them. Then, later, for months, the men with the Yavi accents who came and left, came and left again and again, until they came back with the needle guns, and Pop, cold and small and bleeding to death in her arms. Now she saw that, like the Yavi who had killed Pop, and like those trueborns who had recruited him, this atypically modest trueborn was not who he said he was. The ice in her belly swelled and her breathing rasped. She gripped the bus wheel so that this trueborn, or whoever he really was, couldn't see her fingers tremble. Tam? Jameson reached from the passenger seat and touched her arm. Are you all right? She jerked back at his touch, tore open the driver's door. I'm late for my show. Trailing her costume over her shoulder, on its hanger, she slammed the bus door and ran. Merlin himself held the left door open for her, while Oscar the bouncer held the right. Merlin, his star-studded cone hat drooping, scowled through his fake beard. You're on in four minutes. Don't be late tonight. She brushed past him, tugging the loaded prop vest over her head then covering it with her robe. I'm taking tonight off. Have Maya cover for me. Her boss dropped his draw. Oscar's kid? 
Maya couldn't vanish a frog with a hand grenade. Tam turned back, winked at Oscar. She'll do fine. Four minutes later, the house lights dimmed, except for the main downspot above Tam's center stage table, and except for the pencil spots that lit the tiers of game tables that ringed the stage. The table bots kept on dealing and winning while she performed. As Tam swept down the center aisle and mounted the stage, producing and re-vanishing card fans as she moved, the voiceover boomed above the fanfare. This afternoon's presentation employs no holography, magnetic levitation technology, or electronic augmentation. For the next 30 minutes, what will baffle and delight you is simple magic, the universe's most honest lie. Tam sleepwalked the show, mind racing as her heart pounded. She transformed a customer's empty highball glass into shrink-wrapped packets of five Titan chips, then tossed the packets to the audience. As she did, she spotted Jameson, seated front row left, smiling and applauding, every vanish in production. It surprised her that his smile comforted her. Was this how the Trueborns had recruited Pop? Pop himself always said, first make a friend, then make a deal. She flipped and flourished decks in front of the four spectators at the stage table, conjuring buffs who had paid to watch her work up close. She dealt a winning hand to the slim man in seat two, because he wore a strap-banded antique watch. As she pushed his chips to him, she misdirected him with her touch and a smile while she unfastened the band. When she palmed his watch, the audience, watching the slow-mo overhead replay, roared. But the mark, even though he must have been expecting something, never felt a thing. In that instant, the ping struck her again, no longer a confused question in her head. It was a snarl, so startling in its frustration and nascent anger that she set up stiff, as though she had been slapped. She lost her grip on the card fan she was about to produce, and the prop slipped down through her cloak onto the floor. She towed the cards away from her slipper, then cut the trick from the act. Tam stole a glance at Jameson. He was leaning forward on his elbows now. She had noticed. Or had he caused it? Before Jameson arrived, she only had had a mystery in her head. Now she had a banshee. Pop had gotten mixed up with liars like Jameson, and Pop had died. In that instant, Tam decided to follow through with the plan she had half-formed when Jameson had touched her arm in the parking lot. A half-assed plan implemented in time was better than a perfect plan too late. Her hands trembled, weakened, so she omitted the handcuff escape and skipped to the final trick before the Lady in the Phoenix transformation closed the show. She had to transpose the watch she had palmed, then produce it from the cleavage of the man's wife, who sat to his right. As Tam loaded the watch, she stole a glance at Jameson. He remained seated, again relaxed, though serious and intent. Even before the applause died, when the mark got his watch back, Tam climbed, then stood on the tabletop. She closed her eyes, raised her arms overhead, and the tubular veil floated down from the ceiling and hid her. She dropped through the trap door, and even before the veil above dropped to reveal the flapping, squawking bird that had replaced her, she wormed furiously down the tunnel, scraping her palms and knees. Normally, when she emerged from the floor trap behind the kitchen pantry, she shed her loaded vest before she reappeared at the bar. Today, she ran for the stage door, robes still flapping, like the devil nipped her heels. First, she would put distance between herself and the Earthman. Then she'd think of something. She always did. As she dashed through the kitchen, she jostled a sous chef whistling as he walked and plucked the boning knife from his belt scabbard. He never missed a note. Tam burst through the stage door, squinted against the afternoon sun. She held her breath against the dumpster's stink, then rounded the building's corner, full tilt, car fob in hand, into the employee parking lot, and stopped like she had struck plate glass. Jameson leaned against her car's driver's door, 
arms folded. Tam's mouth hung open as she swung her hand around the fifty cars in the employee lot. How'd you find my car? He flicked his eyes at her rear bumper. I narrowed it to the cars with expired tags. Then I bet on the one with the horn-broken watch-for-finger bumper sticker. Leave me alone. You said you'd be forthcoming, but your face on stage said differently. And you said you were a gambling expert. One honest lie deserves another. What do you mean? She drew the boning knife, crouched. Get away from my car. I can explain. Oh, explain why a gambling cop was on dead end? The trueborn drew back, narrowed his eyes. What? I never said I was on dead end. There are no casinos to inspect on dead end. It's just jungle and giant grizzly bears. Jameson extended his hands, palms down, nodded. Okay, downgraded Earth-like 476 is a primitive. But... There are 512 planets in the human union. What makes you think I came here from that one? I grew up in a starship hub, remember? Hub kids memorize ships and routes like other kids memorize pop lyrics. You said you came to Mousetrap on the Valley Forge, but you still had an up shuttle carry-on tag on your bag. The only port where the Valley Forge calls that bounces shuttles to orbit is dead end. Jameson nodded. Okay, you're a detective. What's it prove? Tam shook her head again. By itself, not much. But a gaming cop who doesn't know about robot dealing? That's hardly. In blackjack, a natural's an ace and a ten-point card, a winner. And a seven or eleven shooting dice. But you didn't even know it was a gambling term. Jameson sighed, ran a hand through his hair. All right. I'm no gambling expert, but the story got me past the gaming authority and past your boss so I could talk to you. She snorted, poked the knife at him. It was an honest lie. Jameson's face hardened. You're no stranger to those, are you, Tamara? Her breath caught. Bad enough that Jameson was a liar. Worse, he knew she was too. She had feared this from the moment Merlin told her a true-born official was coming to see her. Really, she had feared this since the day Pop died. Tam blinked. What are you talking about? I'm talking about, Jameson said, a Yavi refugee in Mousetrap who supports himself and his daughter as a pickpocket, who believes the Cold War has good guys and bad guys, and who believes that working against Yavet and for the good guys is an honest lie. The tears welled, blurred her vision as the knife quivered in her hand. You bastards sucked Pop in, and you didn't protect him from the Yavi when they figured out he was a double for you. Then, to make up for it, you stole what was left of my crummy life and gave me this crummy one. Trader's daughter dies aboard a starship, gets buried in space. Tamara Welder gets dug up on Funhouse. You said you'd never bother me, which is now officially one more lie. Jameson shook his head. That wasn't me. I'm not even that kind of spook. Tam flexed her fingers on the knife's handle, and her lip quivered. Then what kind of spook are you, Jameson, if that's even your name? Jameson sidestepped away from her car, hands still raised. Tam... This isn't about the Cold War. She tossed her head. For trueborns and Yavis, everything's about the Cold War. He stretched a thin smile. It's more important than the Cold War, at least to me. And, if I understand you, to you too. She rolled her eyes. Go ahead, this should be good. Behind them, the kitchen door opened. A busboy stepped out and lit a tobacco cigarette. Jameson eyed him. Can we continue this somewhere private? Tam shifted her weight, stared at the Earthman. If Jameson was the kind of spook who had recruited Pop, he would have pulled a gunpowder pistol on her by now. And as long as she and Jameson stayed around Merlin's, Oscar the Bouncer was only a shriek away. Tam waved the spy away from the car, lifted the driver's door, then she motioned Jameson to sit in the driver's seat. With her knife pricking his throat, she tugged his wrists so that one was atop and one beneath the steering wheel rim. 
Then she dug in the pocket of the loaded vest beneath her cloak until her fingers closed around the handcuffs, the real cuffs, not the breakaways. Tam locked Jameson to her car's steering wheel. Then she swung down the driver's door to close him in, slipped into the front passenger seat, and darkened the dome glass so they weren't visible to onlookers. She faced Jameson across the center console. There. Private. Jameson rattled the cuffs. Seriously, we couldn't just go for coffee? You might poison mine. Talk. I've got another show in an hour. What do you want me to say? Something true would be good. Jameson squirmed in his seat. Okay, truth. You ask me what kind of spook I am. The research kind, I guess. Researching what? That trick you did, where you read that guy's mind? I forced a card on him. You do know telepathy's not a real thing, Jameson. Do I? She paused. You're saying maybe those pings came from somebody? Jameson nodded. Not maybe, and not somebody, something. Tam smirked. Magicians lie for a living, Jameson. You've got to do better. Tam, the reason I was coming from Dead End is that I work there. I'm a xenobiologist and kind of a diplomat. Ambassador to the man-eating grizzly bears? In a way, the Grezen aren't just alien bears. They're the only other intelligent species in the known universe. And they're telepaths. Tam's mouth formed an O. Oh. You're serious? We just found this out? We've known for years, but the Grezen don't trust us as a species. She smiled. They really are intelligent. So we keep their true nature quiet because that's the way they want it. While the government uses them to read all the rest of our minds. Jameson shrugged. There are benign applications, too. All of which has what to do with me? Three months ago, poachers on Dead End managed to kill a female Grezen. Quite a feat of arms, by the way. Even a female weighs nine tons grown and can still sustain 60 miles per hour while gravid. We recovered her body, but we think the unborn cub was extracted alive and smuggled off the planet. To Funhouse? Makes sense, doesn't it? Talk about an up-and-coming contender. And this cub is what pinged me? That's my working hypothesis. Your report was the only lead the real spooks could come up with fast. I'm assuming the cub's probably being kept at that monster fight club next door. Jameson shifted in his seat, nodded at his cuffed wrists. My fingers are turning white. Do you mind? She leaned across, then paused with her fingertips on Jameson's wrists. If I let you go, the cops will raid the place, save the bear, and you'll leave me in peace? Jameson squirmed. Well... God damn it, what well? You got pinged again during the show, didn't you? Tam nodded. What was it like? This time, different. At first it was just, like, a question. What question? Tam shrugged. Not specific, like, did I hold an ace, just curious. Like a baby, maybe. But this time was different? Tam nodded. It was like growling, angry. She leaned toward the slight earthman. What does it mean, Jameson? He frowned, swore. That it's growing up fast? That's why it's just me chasing this thing. There's no time to get operation specialists in place. These people, hell, these murdering kidnappers have no idea what the physical capabilities of even an infant Grez are. If we don't get the cub back before it starts developing, well, at best, they'll get themselves killed. At worst, the cub will have to be killed. And that won't help our relations with our co-intelligent species. Jameson nodded. Or my conscience. I knew the cub's mother. Tam unlocked the cuffs and Jameson rubbed his wrists. She said, There. Now call in the cops. Jameson shook his head. 
I told you, we, mankind, promised the Grez we'd keep their secret. Look what just one bunch of poachers did, just to trap a better pit bull. Imagine what some people, just here on Funhouse, would do to get their hands on a telepath. You're the friggin' government. You can protect them. Presuming they'd trust us to, if we can't even make this incident right. Telepaths don't know how to lie, but they understand that we do. And they've already had a belly full of it. So you're going to try to rescue the baby by yourself? All 165 pounds of you? 168? I was hoping for some help. And since I'm the only one here who already knows the big secret, that could only be me? Tam shook her head and raised her palms at Jameson. Sorry, my family's done being recruited by spies we've got nothing in common with. Fair enough. But you don't like the Bloodsport charnel house on this planet any more than I do. Fair enough. But you don't like the Bloodsport charnel houses on this planet any more than I do. And you've got plenty in common with the cub. It's a six-legged bear. I'm a lounge magician. You're both orphans. Jameson raised a finger. Tam, a baby bird will imprint on a sock puppet if it's the first maternal figure it encounters. Once before we've seen an orphaned Grez imprint telepathically on a nearby human female presence. I have a kid? And I didn't even get laid? Not exactly. But the cub could respond to you as a maternal surrogate. I'm not breastfeeding an alien. Jameson turned pink. The bond's just mental, but if the cub recognizes you, it might trust you. If it trusts you, it might physically follow you. Or it might eat me. They usually just dismember humans. We're too bony. There are nine million women on Funhouse. Why did this thing pick my life to screw up? Well, you were physically nearby, and I suspect you reminded it of its mother. What? Grez and females are absolute matriarchs and apex predators. They confront any challenger head-on. The human equivalent could correspond to a headstrong woman with an absolute hard-on for competing authority. Oh. Any more questions? Tam shook her head. Jameson called up a real-time overhead image of the critter-fest grounds on his handheld. First, We'll need to break into the animal pens, then locate the enclosure where the cubs held. Jameson pointed at the image. There's a fence all the way around, high one by the shadow on the ground. We'll need cutting equipment. He scratched his head. Guard posts here, probably cameras. Tam laid her palm on Jameson's wrist. Jameson, it's not that hard. It isn't. Eleven hours later, in the chill 3 a.m. moonless darkness, Tam pulled her coupe silently in around the electrobus in Merlin's deserted parking lot. As bugs trilled in the surrounding trees, Jameson sat on the pavement, head down and elbows on knees. The bus's dismantled seats lay beside him in a neat row, and wrenches littered the pavement at his feet. When Tam lifted the coupe's door, Jameson massaged his skin knuckles. You said this wasn't hard. My part wasn't. Now, follow me in the bus, park it, and I'll pick you up. Ten minutes later, Jameson sat beside Tam in the coop, parked in the shadow of a wood line fifty yards from Critterfest's main rear service gate. The Earthman peered through night binoculars out the windscreen at the lone watchman, who sat in the guardhouse window, scowling as he polished a pistol. It's not much security, but he's got a gun. They don't need much security, if you think about it. Monsters are their own best watchdogs. And there's no point in sneaking in here to drug the contestants because they get tested before any tickets pay. Behind the guardhouse, a 15-foot-tall fence topped with razor wire secured vast ranks of bar-fronted sheds and stables within which hundreds of vast, dark, disparate shapes groaned, snored, undulated, and rumbled. Occasionally, something snarled or shrieked and set off a chorus of its neighbors. Jameson asked, 
You think he'll just let you drive up and walk in the door? Yep. He's Oscar the Bouncer's cousin. A couple times a month, one of us brings him leftovers from the Merlin's buffet. Get out and wait here. Fifteen minutes later, Jameson climbed back in Tam's coop with her. As they drove to pick up the bus parked on the opposite side of the compound from the guardhouse, Tam told Jameson, He recognized the Grezen when I described it. This place bought it for cash, no questions asked, a couple months ago. It doesn't eat much, but it's still growing. You found out where it's caged? And where the nearest auxiliary gate is to the cage? Tam held up a fob with the keypad on its top. And this is the master key to all the gates and cages. Also to the security camera junction box. But we won't need to mess with it. He never watches the screens while he eats because the animals do disgusting things. He gave you that key? Loaned it. But he doesn't know he did. He doesn't make rounds for an hour. By then, I'll come back for the cake plate, and then his keys will be back on his belt. He'll never miss him. After a further fifteen minutes, the electrobus had driven silently through the auxiliary gate nearest the cub's cage. Tam and Jameson crept to the cage's bars and peered in at the snoring lump inside. Tam pulled her blouse collar across her nose with one hand and breathed through her mouth while she rested the other hand on one of the bars. Do they all smell like this? Think how we smell to them. You get used to it. Now, what do I do? Sing to it? Actually, I'm surprised it hasn't already sensed your BOOM. When the Grezen leapt at Tam and crashed against the bars, its momentum knocked her onto the ground on her back. The cub retreated, and Jameson stepped to the bars. He thumbed the fresh claw gouges on them, then whistled. A week older and he'd have broken through. Tam scrambled to her feet, her eyes glued to the cub in the tiny cage and her jaw slack. The infant was already larger than the largest bear she had seen in a wildlife park. It paced back and forth in its cage, ambling on six claw-footed legs that supported a long-haired, muscular body. But the thing, things, actually, that riveted her were the cub's eyes. Three glowing red coals, glowing in a line above a ragged mouth filled with razor teeth, and the stubby beginnings of down-pointed tusks. They were not the eyes of a brute, but the eyes of a being as curious and sentient as she was. Jameson opened the bus's back door, and Tam climbed in and faced the Grezen as Jameson backed the vehicle up against the cage's locked door. The Grezen stared at her, mute and still as a three-eyed sphinx, betraying no intention. Jameson leaned back from the driver's seat, thumb on the master key's unlock button. Ready? Tam, mouth dry, heart pounding, shook her head. It doesn't know me. Then she felt it. The cub was in her head, and the fire in its eyes died back to a warm glow. Tam whispered out of the corner of her mouth, Open it. You're sure? Tam nodded, and then there was nothing between her and the cub but open air. The cub stared at her, then crouched, its already bulging muscles flexing, scimitar claws scraping the cage floor. Then it slid a forepaw out of its cage into the old electrobus and tapped a claw against metal. Then the cub purred, and Tam cooed back at him. Forty-eight hours later, Tam stood facing Jameson, once again in a star cruiser's shadow at the base of its extended gangway. Jameson said, The cub took sedation perfectly. It's in a hold with no other cargo, and I've got the only pass card. My cabin's one deck forward. Once he's home, he should have no trouble bonding with the childless female. Tam smiled. He'll do fine. I feel it. What will you do after that, Jameson? The Earthman shrugged. I was on my way to Earth for leave when this business blew up. I've never been, but they say it's magic. Jameson shook his head. At best, an honest lie. 
I was actually thinking of coming back here instead. If you'd keep me out of trouble. She smiled again. Maybe, Jameson. Maybe. This has been Magic and Other Honest Lies by Robert Butner, read by PJ Mask. Thank you, PJ. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Robert Butner, PJ Mask, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a solar sail the size of Santa Claus's heart, which is bigger than Indiana if you are making comparisons. And a moon-sized cheer of thanks and praise to Dr. Les Johnson, Bain author and NASA scientist. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> <laughs>